happens. The live streaming is working. Uh, Woohoo! And it says working. Don't take that as a challenge to take down the Wi-Fi in this room by doing crazy stuff. Um, but yeah, so that's working, which is great. Thanks to our host for managing to sort that out. There's a lot of cabling that went on seemingly last night. I've also got the wonderful news that apparently the live stream is working. Also, th thanks actually again to Google support for this. But it's not available in Germany due to IP restrictions. What a wonderful, uh, what a what a wonderful uh, kind of well, an unfortunate but great illustration of some of the challenges of our time. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say very quickly. Some of you have heard this already. I'm sorry if I'm boring you, but those of us we didn't have live stream yesterday. But I just wanted to say a quick introduction to the festival. Um, I'm Rufus Pollock from Open Knowledge. For those of you out there, for those of you in here, um, Open Knowledge is a nonprofit. Uh, we've been around a decade. We're celebrating our birthday last later this year. And our mission has been to open up information and make it used and useful. And a key part of that has been bringing people together. Um, and used and useful can be, as we said, anything from making it faster to get people's way to find out how to get to work, from tackling climate change. Um, we had a great talk yesterday about that, in fact, detecting climate change in, in weather data. Um, through to where our tax money goes and through to you know, saving money. And again, I was going to tell you know, a great story of open data recently. I was talking of concrete examples where I can uh, Commissioner Crow said this earlier to me, and Crew said this earlier to me about like concrete examples. We can see it matters. A great example recently in the UK of saving six million six million pounds in 15 minutes using open data by discovering government duplication and waste, uh, which is fantastic. So it's the kind of things of tangible ways we can say government could be saving money, that we can empower people, that we can stop uh, injustice, and so on. And I'm very grateful uh, that we get to run this. I'm grateful to our sponsors uh, in a big way. Um, and I also just want to welcome everyone to this second day. We hope it's as awesome as yesterday, and we really hope you enjoy it. So yeah, Open Knowledge Festival is really all about you, not about us here up on the stage. And so if you do have access to the internet, today's hashtag is hash OKFest14. And if you look in your program, you'll find there's individual hashtags for many sessions as well. So please do use those, because it helps us create a record of the event for people who aren't able to be here today. There are lots of exciting activities happening today. I do particularly want to mention the UnFestival, our UnConference, where everyone can get involved, propose and run a session yourselves. That's happening throughout the day, so do check that out. We have two particularly exciting events today as well. Today, the closing day of Open Knowledge Festival 2014. At 3 p.m., thank you to Science Open for sponsoring our ice cream break, where ice cream is going to be available for absolutely everybody. And I know that we're all looking forward to that. Also, tonight from 5 p.m., we have our closing concert. Many thanks to Artists Without a Cause. Are they here somewhere in the audience? Give us a shout, Artists Without a Cause. Too early, right? Maybe they're still too early for them. <laughs> they have organized a great range of music for us. There's going to be a lot of excitement around that, so do make sure that you're free um, to come along. Rufus mentioned our sponsors. I should also thank all of our team and all the volunteers and all of you for making the festival possible. And if you want to talk to any of the sponsors or talk to us about Open Knowledge, we're always lovely, super keen to tell everyone about Open Knowledge. You can go to the Palais Room where there's lots of demos and stands and loads of people who'll be happy for you to learn more about what they do. And finally, I don't know if you're running out of clothes yet towards the end of a very hot week in Berlin. We have t-shirts for sale in the ticket office and sales desk in the main courtyard. Today we're doing a special deal on the exclusive Berlin OK Festival shirt as well as the official Open Knowledge shirt. You can get both shirts for just 20 euros. So do go and grab those because we don't want to have to take them back home with us. Um, and they've been going fast so far. So yeah, I hope that you all have a great day um, and get involved. And yeah, over to the main bit of the morning. Thank you. So uh, it's going to be my pleasure to introduce uh, Commissioner Cruz. Um, he's come to join us here in Berlin. I just wanted to begin, though, just I, I'm going to indulge my, my moderator thing for about a minute, is to say that, again, one of the other things we've uh, talked about this week is kind of, I suppose, how we think we make this change. How do we turn open data open into, into open knowledge and into action? And I think the other point is to realize that, that we are at the beginning of this incredible change. There's something really radical. Um, and I was talking earlier, this isn't just a movement. We are entering this world where, you know, if you like, all that glitters is bits where we've moved from a physical, a society based around physical objects to one which physical objects will still be very important, the bread you eat, the car potentially you drive, or the tram you take, but where information is kind of central. And that is basically a seismic change. It's probably the, one of the biggest changes that will ever happen to human society. We don't know how it will play out. But we move from a world where it, 
basically of, from costly reproduction to one of costless reproduction, where it is possible for us to share instantaneously uh, information, ideas, and where our societies, from our economies, most of our economy, to, you know, already in many countries, the majority of the economy is built around service and information industries. From the smallest startups, from SMEs, to web programmers, to Google, um, our, our economy is built around this, but also our culture and many other things. And to be honest, we really have no idea how this could play out. There are plenty, it could be a complete dystopia or it could be amazing. Um, there are plenty of them around. Um, from, you know, if you've read, if you've ever, if you, I'm a bit of a geek, but if you've ever read Neuromancer, um, if you've ever read Gibson's work, which actually I really recommend, it's great literature, um, you'll see this vision of a dystopian future of data, where data is everywhere, but it leads to exploitation, it leads to control. But there are also utopian visions of empowerment, of collaboration. And in some sense, the future is open, <laughs> if you pardon the pun. We have a real choice about how that happens. And some of that is very in the trenches and is often quite dull. It's about regulation, it's about the rules of the game, it's about how we structure this knowledge society. And I'm privileged, therefore, to be introducing Commissioner Cruz, who is, it's really tough. Was, I think one of the things that people I have most admiration for have often been in government, in the civil service, um, in politicians. Often they don't get the, sometimes the best press, but they have often uh, take some of the biggest courage and some of the toughest work to make this kind of change. And frankly, Commissioner Croesus should be one of our incredible heroines, and it's certainly for me. And I'm not, you know, over the last few years, has has, has fought unrelentlessly, unre um, often against, I have to sadly say, um, forces, significant forces in the other direction, um, for better regulation of the information society, from open research, from open access, through to the copyright agenda, um, through to telecommunications. Commissioner Cruz has been at the forefront, I would say, of, of this commission in terms of pushing the kind of policies and approach. And that's one of the hardest places to do that. Um, and it's one of, and I think in that sense, we have a huge debt. So it's my privilege to be inviting Commissioner Cruz up. And I would like actually almost us to begin by having a huge hand of applause, just a thanks for this. Oh. Good morning, everybody. I really yeah, feel the, a bit ashamed for um, too kind all the words, for it's just fun to get this opportunity to do it together with you and with quite a couple of other ones to move uh, Europe forward in this great, exciting challenge. And I was just thinking for, I do have two grandchildren. They are Americans, they are living in San Francisco. The eldest is six years old, and uh, we are Skyping every Sunday afternoon. More fun for the grandma than for the kids, but okay. <laughs> Having said that, at a certain moment, the eldest was asking me, Nene, what is your age, by the way? And I said, I'm 72. And she said, you are still alive? <laughs> so, so I am in a hurry, and I, I really... Uh, uh, <laughs> that, Someone was asking me, why are you coming over for, um, in person? Well, anyhow, I take this opportunity to get food for thought. And still in office, eh? so some people are thinking that we are démissionnaires. No way, I'm paid till the 1st of November, so I will deliver till the 1st of November. And after last night, I think it can be a little bit longer. So <laughs> let them fight. So uh, we go on and uh, still uh, something uh, to do, so to say. What is inspiring for me, and that is out of my heart, you have long championed openness. And it is not just for a fashionable issue, so to say. It's always attractive to get something. But you are filling in. You are just following up when you are saying it is all about openness. And that has long inspired, but not only inspired. It has informed, it has motivated me. And we are in a dialogue. And we are feeding each other. So sometimes it takes a bit longer, and certainly in Brussels, sometimes I think you need eternal life, and I don't believe in eternal life, but anyhow, uh, you are keeping us awake, 
And you should go on for that. And that is not the rebellion way. For you have arguments. So you don't need to be the street fighters or whatever. It can be just pushing um, as a dialogue with information. Open, uh, openness, so to say. In previous years, I was only being able to send my regards and what have you via the video, but now I'm here and already now I got contacts with a couple of you that I think is worthwhile to come over to, come over to Berlin. And Carl, member of my cabinet, and I were already discussing what could we do in September for such an open connection between a couple of uh, spots in the world and then find out uh, what uh, is the challenge, what is the real challenge. For we are aware that every decision takes time, no doubt about that, but we have to be aware that the technology and that the private initiatives, that the entrepreneurship is not waiting for just uh, when we have finished. So keep us, keep us pushing and keep us uh, going. For um, being in the room with you is a pleasure, but it is more than a pleasure. It is indeed food for thought. Let me start with a question, for that is not bad in a open dialogue. Why should we be open? And um, I think there are three compelling reasons for that. Number one, transparency. Also, seems to be a fashionable term. Transparent, who is against? But being concrete when and how transparency is at stake and how you fill in, whether it's how your council spends your money and rightly said, with a bit of transparency sometimes, and not on purpose, it seems to be absolutely crazy. But silos, and well, I can, I can talk about silos. I can, <coughs> even in the own family, it's quite often silos. And it's not on purpose, but let's protect our courtyard. And we are doing our utmost, you are doing your utmost. If you get out of my courtyard, uh, you know all that type of stories. But being honest and being open means absolutely better information. And I am aware that that means better decisions and that that means better governance. So there is a step-by-step -step better situation. Number two, it's fairness. It is about giving taxpayers back what they are already paid for. And that for me is quite crucial. I don't want to be in a position that when I'm walking in the street and sometimes I'm recognized and certainly in the country I pretend to know best and people are asking, what are you doing with our money? For it's quite a bit of money that Brussels is spending and it's not about the amount, but what are you doing with it? From scientific results to traffic information, what could be more sensible than that? And most of all, it is about innovation. Well, who is saying it to whom? The more you share ideas, the more others can build on them. It's a new way of operating and thinking. And that is a lesson learned very early on my in my mandate. I still remember when I, after my first term, uh, got by surprise the second term, but that is another story. Um, I went the second day with my uh, second uh, portfolio. I went to Madrid, I went to the campus party, and it was in the agenda of the commissioner responsible and so on. I didn't have a clue where I was going. Well, I know Madrid, of course, but I didn't have a clue, campus party and so on. It was quite fascinating. It was a thousand European youngsters, a young, the youngest 14 years old and the eldest 30 years old, all camping in the big hall, all blue tents where one person could uh, get for, for sleep, and a gathering with all big names, and I didn't have a clue, so I was asking my member of cabinet, who is that? And well, I got the information and I was getting info. At a certain moment, I was sitting in a group of youngsters and young entrepreneurs, and two of them, both 14 year old, they were discussing with each other their new invention, and um, 14 years old. 
and they were swapping their IDs on a new app. And I said to one, you are crazy. You are feeding your competitor. Come on. And he looked at me, and I will never forget that face. And he said, Madame Commissioner, you are old-fashioned. And that was exactly what was at stake. I was from a generation where you protect your invention and why you try to get business out of that. And now it is sharing and joining, for the result is better. So you have both a better uh, business, so to say. So anyhow, I think that information can long sit uh, in dusty drawers, but it only gains value when opened up. Turning data into jobs, dust into gold. And by the way, if someone is asking me, what is your biggest worry in Europe now? It is the youth unemployment. I think it's absolutely unacceptable that in certain member states, but in all member states it's too high, that in certain member states above 60% the youngsters, no job. And not talking about a period, no job, but never ever a job. No way that that is acceptable. In my opinion, that is really an attack on a democracy. You are talking about people of 18 or 20 years old who can't plan a family, who can't look for an, an, an uh, apartment or whatever. So we have to act. And then, I'm always saying in a college, for example, or in a council, we do have opportunities in this area, in this new technology. There are the opportunities, by the way, and thanks heaven, those youngsters are not all waiting till politicians are giving the solution for them, you are dead and buried, so to say. But they are taking their own initiative, they are starting their business, absolutely fascinating what's going on here in Berlin, but also in London, in Cambridge, in um, uh, Amsterdam, in Paris, and name it, but also in the southern, southern uh, part of, of Europe, in Athens, um, in uh, Madrid, and, and name it. They are starting their own business, app developers, millions of them at the moment, and every day, already here in Berlin, thousand new initiatives, so it's great. I'm proud to have delivered a more open Europe. Yes, we are not there, but we have delivered openness for public administrations, step by step, and shaking up. Um, the EU law now gives a genuine right to every European to, re, uh, to reuse open public information. Don't accept when it is no, for it is in the law, and from any administration in any EU country at any level. So without complex licensing restrictions and without high cost, in almost all the cases, it can only ever be at marginal cost and in the digital age, first basically means for free. Otherwise something has gone very, very wrong. And knock on the door. The EU member states now have one more year to pass those rules into national law. And today, the European Commission is that are starting to get it. And starting to realize that being as open as uh, quite simply part of their function as a public body. But there is a further to go. Countries transpose new laws and start to implement them. And I hope you will <coughs> be behind them, advising them, encouraging them, and inspiring. You are underestimating what your role is. It is about inspiring. It is about not giving up. You wouldn't sit here if you were the type of giving up. You are indeed those of uh, the uh, European population that never gives up, and you have to push those who have to act, so to say. We want to work with you and see you work together across borders and languages, and we have set up Erasmus for Open Data to support that, starting with an event in Nantes, in France, in September. But if you have an idea, let's make that promise. For more, we could do, and then let us know. <coughs> Second, we have delivered for open science. Sharing and openness have always been an essential part of science. Helping the community examine compare and, uh, of course, learn. 
Now we have new ways to do that, like never before. And that is why open access to science can be good for the citizens, can be good for scientists, and can be good for the society. This trend comes not from political instruction, but from the bottom-up, from scientists themselves. And that is as it should be. But it is a trend we can support. And I certainly am. I will support that trend till the last day. Horizon 2020 will offer 80 billion euros for research and innovation, our biggest ever investment. And every resulting publication will be openly and freshly available. Step forward. Plus, we are making big step forward, opening up more research data. And that makes also a lot of sense. Of course, ours is not the only research funding program in town. And we are calling on member states to open up their national programs, and then it makes sense, adding that. Slowly, but surely they are, so they can see that it makes sense. Across Europe and beyond, countries are realizing the benefits and the payback, and that makes sense. And that is just the beginning. Uh, I'd like to see citizens not just informed, that's a good step, no doubt about, about the results of the science, but involved and engaged right from the start. Better participation for improved impact and science that delivers for society. And that is the promise of open digital science with implications for assessment, for review, for access and for more. And now you have a chance to participate and please participate. Our, consult uh, our consultation on science and transition is open until the end of September. Take your chance, take the opportunity, and have your say on the future of science, and go to the site, and the site is tiny, rural, come uh, open digital science. And start by uh, just uh, looking at all the other ones they are certainly in the program this afternoon. Two of my best uh, collaborators, they will just give more information. And third, we are delivering openness for the internet itself. Absolutely for too long, the telco operator has had the right to decide what you can or can't access online and breach net neutrality. Absolutely out of date. It is former century and it's not acceptable anymore. So I've proposed new rules to safeguard the open internet and the open internet for all. I don't want to be faced with a population, with a society of the haves and the have-nots. Everybody should have open internet. And that means <laughs> great. <clears throat> and that means that there is an end of blocking and an end of throttling of services for the first time ever across the EU. And I know for certain that you all have the experience I have now and then to be blocked during a um, and, and call is absolutely um, irritating, to put it in a nice way. Uh, after a couple of years in Brussels, I'm getting a bit of diplomatic language, but it's not me. <laughs> I sincerely hope that national governments can agree it as a priority for our connected continent and will take the decision before the end of Office of Barroso II. And finally, the best investment we can make in our future is education. That too must be open, open education. It is a crime when teachers are prevented from freely sharing open educational resources. How can you explain it? that that still happens. There's so much we can achieve by making every classroom digital. Education, that is not of the pack, but made to measure for every class and every child. And that is what we want to achieve through open education. That shows how copyright rules need to change, but it is just one example. Those rules were designed 
And that is fascinating. On one hand, it's fascinating to realize that it was just designed for a different age, more about a, a limitation and control than talking about creativity and freedom. Holding back ideas, and that is what is at stake from open education, the data mining copyright needs urgent reform. I could go on about the many ways to be open. Open standards, open source. My own website, by the way, now runs on it, I'm proud to say. Open building blocks for new apps. There shall soon be 80 million available for that, uh, euros, for that under our future internet initiative, and so on. But the point I want to make is the mainstream. The topics you are discussing are no longer abstract. Just someone's hobby or just the gem, just talked about in conferences and in um, chat rooms. Big data is used out there, changing lives, changing indeed topics of the political agenda. It isn't something scary, it isn't something that is not your cup of tea, it is every citizen, whatever age, whatever location, it is everyone's cup of tea. Data isn't a four-letter word, nor is open, by the way. It's not just a four-letter word. It's something Europe needs to embrace. Take the opportunity. There is a whole generation that's grown up with a new open approach. They are starting to make their voices heard. And people are listening. People are interested. People know quite a bit. Don't underestimate. Sometimes politicians are underestimated what is the level of their constituency. They are quite clever people. They know what is at stake. Last week, I met uh, the Prime Minister of Italy, Matteo Renzi. He gets it. He is not of my political color, but that's not important. I don't mind. Um, he is young, so he can still change after that. <laughs> but he gets it talking about what is at stake in the digitization. He is committed to the digital agenda. And as he takes the lead, he is now the European presidency, Italy. Um, I am quite uh, pleased. Others, like Commission uh, President-designated uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, are talking about this too. Uh, he mentioned that he will be a digital president, so let's wait for him. Um, I can't judge yet if he is using all the stuff. Uh, okay. Um, but anyhow, you can't say that you are digital if you are not filling in, and if it's only words. And that is, by the way, what is at stake, and I would like to take this opportunity. The team of Juncker is not only about a digital president and my successor, so to say. Juncker needs to take into account that the whole commission needs to be in a different mindset. It is not anymore there is one for the digital agenda. Every commissioner needs to have that link in the opportunities and the challenges of the digitization of our society. So let's make sure that all those nice words, that they stick to it, um, and we need a change. We need a change of mindset. So, and I always say, age is a fixation, so um, that, that doesn't make for me an argument, but it is about what type of mindset. Every lawmaker, every public body, every vested interest who wants to push back, we need to convince them there is a better way of doing, an open way. But I can't do that alone, and I need your help. You are the best ambassadors. You are the best I can think of. I've been long inspired by the energy of this movement for open knowledge, and again, if I could make you an, a sir or an, uh, an, an give you an, a knighthood, I would do it on the spot, but we don't have them. And I will just back all those who can. Um, I've long been inspired. 
I've been inspired by the commitment of this community. Most of all, I've been inspired by <coughs> your positive difference. It can make a positive difference to people's lives across Europe. It really can make a difference. And if that is at stake, why waiting? For we don't have too much time, so to say. Well, anyhow, in the couple of months that are still ahead, I'm intending to fight for those principles and what I was mentioning already. If they are paying me, then I'm delivering. And even if they are not paying me, I'm delivering, I can assure you. I know that the fight won't stop. I know you will continue to make that case and that your voice, very important one, and your message will continue to be heard for your message is based on facts and figures. It is about giving information and that is the level that we need. Let's show every citizen the open opportunity on offer and embrace it together. And at the end of the day, you have more than 500 million people backing your movement. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, just to say on questions, um, it's the similar process yesterday, so please come down to the mic if you're going to want to ask questions. Um, just while people are, I'm going to try and queue a few of you up. So if there's anyone else, please come on over. But I'm just, so that's amazing. I mean, just, just to, I mean, I think one of the things, by the way, just strikes me is I just hope that when I, that, that I can be as energized as you and as passionate as you <laughs> still uh, when, I, when I am 72. Um, so I'm, that's, that's actually my dream right now, I think, because I keep doing this kind of stuff. Wow, we've got a lot of questions. So let's get going. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Klaus Zinser. I'm German national and uh, I have a few points when we talk about data transparency because let's see, I see the European Union as a central place that could help people <coughs> even against their own governments. And uh, so for example, when we talk about data transparency, every year 55 billion euro disappear in secret channels when we talk about farm subsidies. And only maybe 10% of this data is public million people using um, the resources, the information resources. And this points to not just um, the appetite for better informed um, decision making, but it also points to the fact that we can scale some of the things that all of us in this room are fighting for, where a lot of us are building very meaningful and very important both platforms as well as initiatives and movements, but we often fall short on the scale question. Um, the, some of the most recent bigger experiments have been in places like Indonesia and India. Now, India is one of the largest and most complex um, democracies in the world, where an, a democratic election doesn't just run over two or three days, it runs over weeks. You've got thousands and thousands of candidates, you've got scores of parties, multitudes of platforms, and people often need to decipher all of that to make a meaningful decision about who's going to be shaping not just meta-politics, but stuff down at local level. And how do you do that if there's a dearth of information? So a lot of the stuff that Google initially did was trying to pull together search results and aggregated existing information. More recently, it's building APIs so that third parties can reuse this stuff and build decision-making tools. It means that effectively, Google is starting to build some of this digital backbone that is powering our societies. And like with railways, which um, powered a lot of the industrial revolution in the past, um, that means that we need to start having very open and robust discussions about ownership of some of this backbone. So I think what Eric's going to do is speak us through some of the complexities beyond just policy, and then also help us kind of start exploring some of both how we got to where we currently are, and then potentially what the route forward is. And that's not just code and content, in some places in Africa where I've come from and we've seen the development of a lot of the election portals, it's also starting to think about how to actually get connectivity to people. So everything from fiber in the States 
in, in the African context, it's using, using the gaps between um, television broadcasts, broadband, to actually beam connectivity at people in rural areas who've previously never had digital connectivity of any sort, and suddenly having a whole new world open up to them. Um, so, with um, not much more than that, over to Eric. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Justin. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and I have a very tough job of following that amazing talk by Commissioner Cruz. So, uh, I'm going to actually start in a uh, very different place, uh, very non-technical. I want to start with roads. So, imagine you were a student uh, at Cambridge University in 17th century England. Let's say you wanted to take a trip. You wanted to travel down to London. This isn't a very long distance. It's under 65 miles. Today, you could probably do that in about an hour and a half. But back in the 17th century, you'd probably be thrilled to make this trip because there was an amazing new technological advancement that was just starting to reach broad adoption. This is the stagecoach. The stagecoach was a huge technological achievement. Uh, previous wagons didn't really have suspension systems, meaning they were always off balance. So pretty regularly, drivers would instruct all the passengers to lean out one side and then the other to actually stop it from overturning. These things also didn't have seats. They just had uh, hard benches. So the stagecoach was great. It had suspension systems, wouldn't overturn, and had real seats with backs on them. So you'd be thrilled to get to ride in one of these things. And you would better be, because back in 1750, this trip of just 65 miles would take a full two days. That's moving at a really hardy pace of 1.3 miles an hour. So why was this so slow? It wasn't the stagecoaches. These things could go way faster than this. The problem was actually with really poor roads. And this stemmed from actually a government problem. At the time, the way the English government worked, responsibility for roads was delegated to the local parishes or towns. This worked all right for uh, the roads that were frequently used by the locals, but it really fell apart for the long-distance highways that were primarily used by travelers. So the town governments had no incentive to fix roads that weren't actually used by their citizens. So in order to fix this, Parliament started setting up organizations called turnpike trusts. These were new groups that brought together uh, governments, companies, and road users and collected, uh, collected funds from all the different parishes that uh, these roads went through and also started to lay tolls. They did some really amazing work. They improved the quality of the roads, made them drivable. They did some new innovations like introducing milestones telling travelers the distance between major towns. And they even introduced the first rules of the road, like mandating driving on the left-hand side. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, these turnpike trusts helped road transport take off in England and actually overtake ships as the best way of getting between England's towns. But they also improved stagecoach technology. Better roads meant lighter and faster stagecoaches could be designed, Faster stagecoaches meant there, were more, there was more traffic on the roads, meant more tolls, which then went right back into improving the roads. So you had this great cycle going on. But most importantly for our student, these trusts and the improvements they enabled cut down that brutal two-hour trip in 1750 to just seven hours in 1820. So why am I telling you all of this? It's not because I'm a transportation history buff, although I think this is pretty cool. It's because when I look at our movement today, I see a whole lot of incredible stagecoaches, but not enough good roads to drive them on. I and my colleagues at Google are in awe of the incredible work that's being done by everyone in this room and by uh, participants around the world. Together, we are improving public service delivery. We are uh, engaging more citizens in the political process, and we are uh, making governments more accountable throughout the world, just to name a few. By many accounts, our sector is booming. A lot of you have probably seen this great report from the Knight Foundation saying that between 2008 and 2012, our sector grew annually by 23%. More people are getting involved, more tools and services are being built, more investments are being made, 
and most importantly, more people's lives are being improved. But despite that, we're not living up to our potential, at least not yet. You can see this on any number of fronts. Um, for years now, we've been on the cusp of having our systems of government fundamentally transformed by the internet. And we started to see innovations in campaigning and fundraising. But when it comes to making big decisions, our fundamental models of politics have stayed pretty similar. In the past year, many of the top stories around this space have unfortunately been overwhelmingly negative, focusing on times when government's uses of technology have fallen down or gone too far. And perhaps most importantly, public trust in government continues to decline, pushing back on one of the long-held beliefs of many in the space, myself included, that increased transparency through technology can increase public confidence. Now, we're doing important work, and it is helping people. But too much of our work today is the equivalent of building better stagecoaches in the 17th century. We're producing incredible, innovative technologies, but they're being blocked from achieving maximum impact because we don't have the necessary public infrastructure to support it. Today, I want to talk about the need to shift our focus away from the latest shiny apps and towards infrastructure and collaboration. So I'm going to talk about three things we can do to make that happen. First, we must be clear that open isn't enough. The phrase open data is great, but it should always be accompanied by words like structured, licensed, and updated. Second, it's time for us to focus on interoperable data. We're currently just scratching the surface of what open data can achieve. And through interoperable data and interoperable APIs, we can take our work to the next level. And third, we need to focus on building ecosystems, not apps. By working together more regularly and in new ways, we can make sure our work is sustainable and has a proven impact. So first, open isn't enough. The incredible growth of open data and open government is an amazing thing. But our focus on that single adjective, and I know I have a tough crowd for that here, gives some in our community an excuse to think that their responsibilities start and end with being open, and that's holding us back. All too often, data is released and delivered in ways that don't provide incentives for anyone to use it. Data sits out there, never being used, never living up to its potential. Or in those cases when open data is used, everyone, and many of you know this well, are doing the same work over and over again to make it usable. So to quantify this, let's look at some research into open data publishing that's been done by my team at Google as well as by some others. So when looking at the US and Europe, uh, open data is very often released as spreadsheets or documents instead of in structured data formats. Particularly in Europe, spreadsheets far exceed structured data. Now, this in many cases is all right. Spreadsheets and documents can be fine for one-off analysis or for certain data types. But for many developers looking to build real serious applications, we need structured data. Now, releasing data in a structured format is the first step. You then have to make it legally usable. This means being released under a license that permits reuse and in many cases modification. Without proper licensing, again, open data might be usable at a hackathon or for a side project. But if you're looking to build a real business on top of open data, you can't just use unlicensed data and hope for the best. You need the certainty that comes with a clear license. Unfortunately, that hardly ever happens. This research looks at 100 top open data portals, and it finds that the overwhelming majority has no clear license indicated at all. Now, in a lot of these cases, I'm sure the licensing is covered by a local law or regulation, but that's not OK. We're developers, not lawyers we need licenses to be clear and easily understandable. Public domain licenses like Creative Commons Zero are actually the best here, giving developers broad rights to, to use the data in innovative ways without worrying about license terms. Open data also rarely gets updated with new data. And in many cases, when new data gets released, it's just released as a new data set instead of as an update on top of the old one. Again, this looks at 100 top portals 
and it finds that barely anyone actually updates data once they release it. But there is one clear outlier here. I wish Ori were still around today to see this. It looks like Kenya is really outpacing the rest of us when it comes to keeping their data updated. So without timely updates, yet again, open data is okay for side projects, for hackathons, but not for serious development. Think about what would happen at Google if we had released the Google Maps API once and never updated it as new businesses or new roads open. How many applications would actually get built on top of it? So these three things are pretty key, structured, updated, and licensed. We talk a lot about open, but by just talking about that one adjective, we give publishers an excuse to avoid these other key elements that are just as important to making data usable. So some people are doing this very well, and I'm good, any examples I give today are just as good ones that come to mind, uh, although I'm sure many of us could talk about many more. Uh, the UK government releases most of their data in an open government license and has more CSVs than Excel files. The frictionless data project from Open Knowledge that many of you work on is outside of government starting to make progress towards a lightweight standard for structured and usable data. But for every a good example here, there are too many that are not doing this. It's up to all of us to extend our calls for openness to focus on structures, updates, and uh, licenses on top of our data. This is sort of equivalent to, uh, again, looking back to the English turnpikes, rules like driving on the left, setting the first rules of the road, helped accelerate the, the development of the turnpikes and of all manner of technology. In our space as well, we can set these rules of the road, prioritize them, and do far more. So once we have interoperable data, or sorry, once we have uh, structured data, we can start talking about making it interoperable. Interoperability is the key to unlocking new potential in open data. Today, it's far too hard to connect different types of open data together. Let's say I want to build an app that tells you who donated to your local counselor's last election campaign. There are two parts to this. First, you need to look up who your local counselor is, and then you need to see who their donors were. There are plenty of APIs, data sets that do both of these things. But right now, it's often far too difficult to take the representative you found that represents someone and connect it with the donor's data. You can do this manually if it's a small data set, but certainly not at scale. So our lack of data interoperability is holding back our uses of open data into, the more, into more basic applications and preventing more innovative use. Interoperability is also key to scale. I might build and launch this app in Berlin, and that'd be great. But if I want to turn this into a business, Berlin probably isn't enough, while great. It's far too hard and far too expensive to expand applications on top of open data to other cities, either in Germany, Europe, or the rest of the world. And again, this serves to block innovative uses and hold us back from extending our work outside of hackathons, outside of side projects, and into real businesses. Interoperability is also not something that's unique to our space. Think about how we are all trying to connect to the internet today through Wi-Fi. When it works, Wi-Fi is great. Interoperability means that all of us from different countries using completely different devices can get on at the same networks. Think of how tough it would be if we had to connect to different networks for Mac and PC users, for phone or laptop users, or if as an American, I had to connect to a different network than what Europeans had set up here. So Wi-Fi has helped enable massive global scale, but it's also led to significant innovation. In 1988, when the, the 802.11 spec was first being developed, it was not for personal computers at all. It was actually for cash registers. Its developers only uh, later figured out the amazing potential of wireless networking for personal computers. Back then, they couldn't have even dreamed of all of the innovative applications that would be built on top of Wi-Fi today. Everything from new devices like, uh, new devices like uh, refrigerators, watches, or TVs, to uh, new methods of connectivity, like in-flight Wi-Fi or portable hotspot. An open spec and an interoperable spec open the door to all types of new innovation. 
So we are in our space making some really strong early efforts towards interoperability. The Popolo project is a great example of creating an interoperable international spec for legislative data that's already been picked up by several, in several continents. My team at Google helped start the Open Civic Data Project, along with the Sunlight Foundation, Open North, and Granicus. One of the unique elements of this is a focus not on data formats, but on interoperable identifiers. So even if data is in different formats, as long as IDs for key elements like political jurisdictions match, you can still very easily connect different data sets. So we are making progress, but we have a lot of work to do. Data interoperability is key to scale our work globally, but also to unlock completely new applications that we haven't even dreamed of. It won't be long before open government and open data in 2014 looks as simple as when Wi-Fi was just for networking personal computers. But we have to work together and prioritize interoperability to make that happen. So I've said working together a few times right now today. I want to close by talking about how we can do more of that. We need to focus on building ecosystems, not apps. Here's a pattern that many of you probably know far too well. A government agency decides to open up a new data set. They pull in a civil society partner to hold a hackathon. A weekend and a lot of Red Bull later, uh, the, a couple interesting prototypes have been produced and the agency gets some great press uh, for being open and innovative. But then in too many cases, when you fast forward a few months, none of those prototypes are being maintained or used, and the, open, the newly opened data is barely being touched. The problem here is that hackathons produce apps when we need to focus on ecosystems. It's easy to talk about the need for a killer app on top of open data, but that just doesn't exist. When you look at the success stories in our space, the ones I've talked about today, the ones we're all talking about at this conference, very rarely are they individual apps. They're strong, healthy ecosystems that enable collaboration in new ways. So for an idea of how we can create more ecosystems, we can once again go back to the English turnpikes. When the local governments didn't have incentives to promote the infrastructure that was necessary for good roads, the English set up turnpike trusts, groups that brought together governments, road users, companies, and got them to invest in infrastructure. They were building early ecosystems on top of this technology. We need our own turnpike trusts to enable new, new ecosystems in our work. We're starting to see some really great examples of that. One that was highlighted earlier this week is Code for Germany, which is a project of open knowledge Germany that Google's really proud to be a supporter of. They launched just in February, just a few months ago. And since then, they've already launched labs in 14 cities across the country and racked up 4,000 hours of volunteer development work. They've done this by focusing on the ecosystem, not on individual apps. And this approach has let them quickly build tools and scale them around the country and reduce a lot of the repeated work that was previously taking place in different cities. To see how this type of approach can work over a, period, a longer period of time, we can talk about an effort that my team's been privileged to be a part of for seven years now, the Voting Information Project. This effort started in 2007, when a number of groups in the United States uh, were looking at the problem of enabling easy access to information on where to vote and other election procedural information online. Google was one of these groups. Our interest came from uh, engineers that looked at broad search trends and noticed these big spikes before every election for terms like register to vote and where do I vote. We found we did a really bad job of answering these questions because this data was split across hundreds of government agencies and back then only 11 of 50 states had any of this information online at all. So along with the Pew Charitable Trusts, we set out to uh, collect and standardize this information. What's really uh, interesting here is really how different groups came together to make this possible. We all sat down and created a first, uh, the first open spec for voting information. And I realize I think this is probably the first time we're showing some code in one of these slides, so I'm happy to do that. Um, 
Pew then funded civil society groups to work with, uh, to work with governments and help them get this data into this format. We realized they wouldn't just start publishing it alone. At Google, we then ingested this data and provided it to our users when they started searching for it. But we didn't just take the data and, uh, then, and not give anything back. We actually analyzed the data, identified possible errors uh, where there might be issues with the geodata, and then surfaced that and pushed that back to governments to help them fix their information. We also opened it up through an open API that made it easier to use than dealing with the raw data. This enabled a whole host of new innovations on top of it, everything from building an SMS service on top of the uh, voting information to getting it on the homepage of CNN. This type of collaboration goes far beyond just hackathons and conferences. It's enabled a healthy ecosystem of funders, governments, civil society groups, and private corporations. And the results have been really incredible. We've provided nationwide voting information for the last three US national elections, and we're on track for our fourth this November. Like Justin said, in 2012, we had nearly 24 million lookups on top of this data from 600 different apps and sites. That wouldn't have been possible if it was just Google. It really took the entire ecosystem to make this work. These types of projects and many others are successful because they're focused on building ecosystems and not apps. Building together disparate interests and different types of organizations and getting us collaborating regularly helps us keep this. Thanks for coming and thanks for engaging sure. with us. And uh, my question basically is, Google's uh, business model is about processing data, personal data, public data. So in the case of public data, you are aligned with us and you fight with us and this is really great. But uh, how do you think uh, can we overcome the problem between our constitutional cherishment of privacy and Google's business model. Could open data be a possibility for transforming Google's business model to even improve that situation, maybe? Sure, and what, sorry, what, what group are you from? Pardon me? Oh, what, uh, did you say your name in the group you're from? Um, I'm mainly speaking for myself. Oh, sure, all right. Um, sure, yeah, that's a great question. I think um, I actually really do think our interests are aligned not just when it comes to uh, open and public data, but when it comes to privacy as well. We take privacy extremely seriously as a company. And uh, you, you mentioned open data possibly helping evolve our business model there. It, it really has. Um, as a company, we have a, a privacy dashboard that shows you all the information that Google does have connected with your account. And not only that, but makes it really easy to uh, export that data so that you can use it in, a di in another service uh, and also to delete that data if you want. So we're, we're firm believers that uh, openness is just as important when it comes to your choice between different services uh, as it is uh, when looking at government data. Question, go for it. Yes, thanks. My name is Sarah Schott, and I'm currently working on a book on open government and worked in the field for the last decade. And I, I like the, the example you gave of the uh, British road system and its development. But looking at it and looking at the challenges ahead of governments, it seems like they're not really even at a point of planning out a, a interconnected road system because there aren't the resources for the pavers. We have such a, the problems we face are much more complicated than just building roads and also much more interconnected. They're not just issues of one level of government or one country, but globally. Um, and so we are uh, doing quite a bit to try and uh, provide more resources and tools and help governments do this. Um, one, we are a big supporter of groups that are uh, trying to engage directly. So we were early and large funder of Code for America. Uh, like I mentioned, we've been, uh, we're excited to help get Code for Germany off the ground. And uh, we think by supporting organizations like that, as well as uh, 
groups like My Society and Ciudadano Inteligente that have started Poplis, uh, we believe we're doing a lot through uh, providing funds in the right way to get um, to get groups to do a lot of this, to encourage groups to do a lot of this work. Um, when it comes to engaging with government directly, we will have a lot. Uh, we have regular conversations with folks at all levels of government, uh, talking about the value of this and uh, f pushing for this from a policy perspective. Um, a lot of our team's early work. Uh, came about in the US after President Obama was first elected, helping look at things like how can you um, run analytics on your website or how can you use Google Apps or some of these free services that are um, so important to getting that basic infrastructure in place to scale. Uh, so I think that's, an that's another piece of what we do. Um, and then really through work like the Voting Information Project, which was a singular example for uh, voting information, but I think can ex apply to many other types of data and types of governments. Uh, we believe that by having a really strong use case on top of open data uh, is, the best, is the best way for us to encourage uh, and really motivate governments to release and invest in the infrastructure. Uh, when users are coming to Google and seeing uh, open data surfaced and presented to them, it uh, provides a really clear incentive, uh, and then we can work with civil society and uh, foundations to make sure that governments have the resources to uh, put to um, actually get data to us in the right way. Thanks. Just building on that question while the next person lines up, an ecosystem, even though Google in many senses is the gorilla in the room, um, yep. you can't do all of this on your own. Right. So what are you or are you doing anything to try and get other enabling organizations with the resources and potentially with the leverage to work f towards similar goals? Um, yeah. While you're answering that, if the next, um, next guys can line up. Yeah, I hope, we, I hope we're not the gorilla in the room. We really want to be a participant and we want to be sitting at the table with all of you and, and learning from all of your amazing work. Um, many of you have been at this for quite a bit longer than we have and we, we know we have particularly when it comes to the international space, so much to learn. Um, that is the exact right point, that we uh, don't want Google to be in the position of uh, having, government, uh, having anyone rely on us to be doing this. this is th these are fundamental tasks and fundamental pieces of building a government and building a society that uh, really should have, there should be capacity for it in each country and in each government. So uh, in a lot of our work in, in elections, as in fact, we've uh, put a lot of effort into uh, investing in local NGOs and civil society groups, uh, connecting governments, not with the big standard vendors in the space, but with local startups who are really scrappy and using interesting technologies and getting them talking and getting them working together to do a lot of this work rather than uh, doing it ourselves. And that can uh, be more complicated, but in the long run, we really believe it's worth it. Um, hello, my name is Andrew Thompson. I work at a, a geospatial company called Azavia in, in the United States. Um, and you, in your answer to the last question that Sarah posed, you mentioned uh, something called Popeless. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I know what that is, and I'm sure you know what that is, but I bet not a whole lot, uh, everyone in the room knows. So do you, could you think you could expand on what Popeless is? I think it applies to your roads analogy in a pretty yeah. great deal. Definitely, yeah. And I, uh Thank you for calling that out. I was, had that in an earlier version and had to shift some things around. But yeah, Poplis is an amazing effort that many of you are far more qualified than I am to, to speak about. So if anyone that's involved wants to like stand up and uh, be someone that people should talk to, that'd be great as well. But it was a project that got started by my society in the UK and Ciudadano Inteligente in Chile, as well as a number of other uh, organizations that builds, uh, as opposed to building uh, full-on apps or websites that are intended to be uh, released uh, in different countries. They build interoperable components for different pieces like um, re registries of politicians, parliamentary monitoring sites, uh, contacting representatives. And one of the reasons that I really love it is that it, it's an acknowledgement that there is no one-size-fits-all solution for every country, but there, are, there is a lot of common work that we can build on top of to move much faster. In the audience, so if anyone wants to follow through on that, they, it literally is developing into a movement. Um, and some of the components are now being built outside of the My Society family. Yeah. 
So it's actually started to go viral as well. Next, next set of questions. Hi, I'm uh, Andrew from Bermuda. Uh, so as you've pointed out, we need to build ecosystems. So clear, uh, clearly Google is good at sharing code, good at sharing data. Uh, but have, has, has your group ever thought more about sharing examples of processes that work? So a lot of the documentation that has nothing to do with the technical stuff, but is uh, sort of a, a good process that works and can be, could be replicated elsewhere. Yeah, that is an awesome question. Um, we actually are working on something like that right now. Uh, we are, uh, a lot of the groups that were responsible for the voting information project are actually putting together a white paper that covers not just, probably even less of an emphasis on technically what worked and more procedurally how groups came together and how, um, uh, and how uh, the, uh, we engaged with government to make that work. Uh, that's still being drafted, but we should connect and be sure you, we can share that when it's out. But generally, I think that's something we, we should all do much more of, and is, you're right, that's very important to continuing this conversation. Would that, in, would that include insights into how you actually get some of these tools and information sources in front of people at the right time to actually do something with it? Yeah, definitely. I think that's an equally important part of it is how... Um, you have to build, you, building something is half the battle, then you have to actually put it in front of real people. And uh, whether for us we are lucky in that we can connect with uh, some of the biggest platforms out there like Google Search, although that adds whole levels of complexity as well. Uh, but uh, there are any number of wet things and there are examples around, uh, around the room and around the world of your great uh, marketing and great rollout campaigns of these things that are something we should be highlighting too. Next set of question. Hi, I'm Andrew Clark. I work in the government transparency team at Amidia Network. Um, thanks for your thoughts on interop interoperability. Um, I wondered if you could prioritize one building block for tying up different data sets that, would, that requires sort of action across the world. What would that be? I mean, I would put a plug in for government uh, legal entity identifiers or, and government entity identifiers, but I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah. I would agree. It's it's entities and it's uh, the, the the nouns of uh, of government and of open data. Um, we've we've started this with open civic data. We've done jurisdictions and geographic entities, which are really the easy first part. Uh, but we want to work together and figure out people, organizations, committees, bills. Uh, that's I think the next step. And I agree that once you have that, that once you're interoperable on those elements. Uh, we can do much more than we can today. Which is also why Populous becomes so important, that it's dealing with a lot of those yeah. entities. We've got time for one more short question and also a very tight answer. Okay, my name is Peter Kranz, I'm from Sweden. Uh, you make a great case for interoperability, but um, interoperability builds on standards and standardization, creating standards can be very boring, tedious work, which is far away from your activist uh, ideas. Do you have any ideas on how to engage people in uh, creating the standards that we need in all these areas? Because there are so many of them. Yeah, I think, well, one, we have the people here to start these conversations and continue these conversations. And I mean, many of the uh, just conversations over beers the past couple of days have started blossoming into, whoa, and how could we standardize a lot of that? So I think a lot of it's taking better advantage of the times we are together, uh, following up in a very lightweight way. I'm not advocating for more standards bodies by any means. Uh, and in many cases, standards probably aren't even the right word. We just want to talk about sharing data formats, sharing practices. Uh, and I think we can continue to do that in really light ways, but also ways that are driven by compelling uses and compelling apps, uh, not just by the need to say we have a standard. So you have to have them work hand in hand. Great. Thanks very much, yeah. Eric. Um, Thanks. So we've kind of run out of time. Thanks very much. Um, the, you're going to be around for the rest of the day. Yep. And I think that's just coming back to the point that we do need robust conversation around this. So see, seek him out. There are other members of the Google team on the elections and politics team here as well, um, all of whom I'm sure would be keen to, to kind of engage and find out who's doing what in this space. So thanks very much. Thank you.
Have I got sound? Okay, that's it for us um, this morning in here. Um, I would have been great. Thank you so much to our to our speakers. It was fantastic. Um, I kind of I always think of uh, Back to the Future, where we're going. We don't need roads. Um, okay, because um, uh, <laughs> um, um, we've got a flying car. Um, so so. That's it for this morning. It's going to be into the great sessions. Remember, I'm so looking. This is the first open knowledge festival with live music um, put on. So I'm really looking forward to that this afternoon. But it's onwards and upwards. Please go head on. Uh, I think the sessions is it 12 or 12:15? 12, right? So we got go. Thank you.